Ventilator pneumonias, which we'll talk a lot about during the lecture, um, are specifically set aside for those people who have been ventilated uh, for 24 hours or greater, um, and they acquire pneumonia from uh, the ventilation, which I'll explain later why that happens. Um, and these are, are hopefully, um, we're trying to keep these as low as possible. There's a mandate um, in the government with reimbursement uh, to uh, push us to have no ventilator patients have pneumonias. The rate was very high years ago. It's coming down. Um, and you'll find that basically the way we do this is through really aggressive oral care. One of the things I found helpful and uh, was to find pictures uh, to work with the nurses with. Uh, what does a normal set of lips look like? How do I know what's normal and what's abnormal? And in this video, or in these slides, you can see this is a typical healthy oral mouth. And this is a patient who's already beginning to develop candidiasis. They have cracks at the vermilion uh, at the corners of the mouth. Again, this, because of all the bacteria here and the way the patients drool when they sleep, etc., this becomes very irritated and then becomes a pathway into the bloodstream, which can make them sick. So these pictures um, are available all over the net these days. Um, these are from Dr. Chalmers, I think, out at Iowa, who's passed away. She was one of the early um, believers in oral care, and she has some wonderful stuff that's still available. Just go to Iowa, pipe in University of Iowa oral care, and her stuff will pop up for you. Candidiasis was a, always a problem for me. They, I don't know how many times I got referrals for patients with pain with swallowing. It was so typical. Um, and I would come up and I'd say, well, did, and as soon as the patient opened their mouth, you could tell they had thrush. And I said to the nurse, did you, did you look in his mouth and see that, this? And she said, what? And I go, look, oh, he's got thrush. Yeah, yeah, he's got thrush. That's, that was, you know, the pain was swallowing. It was something there was, had nothing to do with any kind of structural problem. It was actual candidiasis. And so many of our patients who are in the extended care world or in uh, long-term, uh, you know, high-risk groups um, have candidiasis because of all the antibiotics they've been taking. Uh, and so once we uh, uh, put in oral care programs at the two hospitals where I worked before I worked here, um, those referrals just sort of dried up and disappeared. It was, it was really kind of a neat side effect. I just kind of realized one day, gosh, we weren't getting those anymore. The nurses were catching the candidiasis themselves. Let me give you a really good uh, place to start if you don't know where to begin. Uh, this is a wonderful handout uh, of nursing from the Registered Nursing Association of Ontario. The Canadians are far and away advanced in this area. I've been up there teaching for years now, and because of healthcare costs and trying to keep costs low, when they saw the research coming out about oral health um, and nursing intervention, they really got on the bandwagon. And uh, uh, throughout the country, both on the eastern side of Canada, the western side of Canada now, they have really have great interventions, um, great tools to use. If you don't want to invent an evaluation tool, they have ones that are available now for you to use. But getting a hold of the RNAO, um, this is available online actually as a PDF now, you can find it. Um, it's full of really great information. It's very, very helpful. They talk about um, how, to, how to brush the teeth of difficult patients, what a bare minimum oral care should look like, um, how to have patients become independent in oral care. They even have videos online now on YouTube, which I came across a couple of years ago, which, which showed how, to, for instance, what do you do with someone who's a biter? How do you uh, do oral care with someone who bites? And they have really done a terrific job. Uh, this is a great reference, and I hope you'll find it and have no, uh, no good, nothing but good times reading it because they really um, have done a terrific job of getting this information all together in one place. Uh, one of the things I really like, too, is the level of evidence that they, they use. So for their recommended practices, they, you know, the level of evidence of three is different than a level of evidence of four. The lower the number, the, uh, the better it is. So we, the, you, you know, like randomized controls uh, studies are a level of evidence of one. So they, they're the best research that we have. Whereas a four is maybe just observation of a few different patients in a small group study, et cetera. But this will give you the, um, the data that you need, the, the background that you need for when you're arguing uh, with the, uh, with the staff and, their, and the physicians, et cetera, when you're developing these programs because they want to see evidence and the level of evidence matters in, in this day and age. You see there's some good uh, recommendations there too. This will, like I say, you can actually use this as a template for how, how you want to develop your program as well. You want to make sure the, all of these variables are covered. What if they can't be at 30 degrees? Uh, as I mentioned, there's people that can't. Maybe they're a fall risk. Maybe they have low blood pressure. Maybe they have femoral lines in place or it hurts for them to be uh, away from the supine position. So what you can do is use a combination of elevating the head of the bed and reverse Trendelenburg. 
Uh, the head is kept between 15 and 30 degrees, which is more comfortable for the patient, but the bed then is placed at 30 degree angle. And I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. This is one of those great things that I teach nurses all the time because they're so frustrated with patients who are sliding down and they said, oh, he's on two feeding and he keeps lowering his bed. Well, here's the trick. There you go. You keep the patient at 10 degrees, but you put the whole bed in uh, reverse Trendelenburg. And so you're getting your 30 degrees of elevation that you need for safety purposes. Family's happy, patient's happy. This is particularly true of back patients, patients who complain of back pain, or uh, morbidly obese patients. Of course, we have a lot of those these days. And uh, it's hard for them to remain at 45. Their backs hurt so much, especially in the bed. If you've ever been in a hospital bed for any length of time, you'll know that they are nowhere near as comfortable as you might think they are. Um, and it is, and your back does hurt. So um, this has been a great trick to use, and I've taught this to many, many, many nurses.